quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Medical Marijuana Radio. This one is for Saturday, the 15th of October, 2016. I'm your host, Larry Love. We're here every week to bring you the latest information on medical cannabis and recreational adult use cannabis from all over the globe. Uh, this week, our guest will be Josh McCurdy, who is the uh, head consultant at Grandma's Boys Consulting here in New Mexico. We're going to talk about harvesting and curing your personal grow, and we'll be doing that right after the news. Um, first, I'm going to play you a little clip of uh, the governor of Maine. His name is Governor LePage, Paul LePage. And uh, then I'm going to read you a little article after that. Here is six false claims about marijuana from the governor of Maine who wants to keep marijuana from being legal. And, of course, we know about all the lying that the Republicans do. Uh, this is just another example of what we have to do to fight the lying. Here, here's this clip. Question one is not just bad for Maine. It can be deadly. Marijuana kills people on the highways. Traffic deaths in Colorado have increased dramatically. Marijuana is three times stronger than it was in the 1980s. People addicted to marijuana are three times more likely to be addicted to heroin. Heroin is already killing seven Mainers a week. We do not need to legalize another drug that could lead to more deaths. THC levels in marijuana Snacks are so high, they could kill children and pets. Pot snacks, like cookies, candy, gummy bears, and soda. Children can't tell if their weed is in these snacks. People will smoke marijuana in pot stores right next to schools, daycare centers, and churches. They will smoke weed and sell pot at state fairs. Businesses could not fire employees for using marijuana. Before you vote, please educate yourself on this dangerous issue. Yes, please educate yourself. So, again, uh, lies and the lying liars that tell them. You know, that this is one of those guys. Um, six false claims about marijuana from Governor of Maine, Governor LePage. The Governor of Maine uh, sent, you know, made that message a few days ago. Um, and this is from attention.com. Uh, in 74 seconds, LePage managed to make six misleading claims about marijuana legalization. Number one, marijuana kills people on the highways. Traffic deaths in Colorado have increased dramatically. The Drug Policy Alliance released a report this week that debunks the idea that legalization leads to increased traffic deaths. Looking at the federal traffic statistics in Colorado and Washington, two states that have recreational marijuana uh, where it's legal, the DPA concluded that the post-legalization traffic fatality rate has remained statistically consistent with the pre-legalization levels, is lower in each state than it was a decade prior, and is lower than the national rate. Number two, marijuana is three times stronger than it was in the 1980s. Um, though the concentration of THC, um, uh, the main psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, has increased over the decades, there's no evidence that increased potency makes the product more dangerous. If anything, it means that users and patients don't have to smoke as much cannabis to produce the desired effect. Number three. 
People addicted to marijuana are three times more likely to be addicted to heroin. Heroin is already killing seven Mainers a week. We do not need to legalize another drug that could lead to more deaths. This is what the, uh, the governor said. Research uh, shows marijuana is not physically addictive. It can create psychologically dependent, psychological dependence in some users, but comparing that dependency to heroin addiction is highly misleading. Number four, THC levels of marijuana snacks, edibles, are so high they could kill children and pets. The think about the children argument LePage is going for here is not supported by statistical evidence. There has never been a documented case of fatal marijuana overdose in humans. No child has ever died from accidentally eating a pot brownie. That doesn't make it safe for children to ingest cannabis, of course. They shouldn't, and users should treat edibles like any other drug and keep it properly stored to avoid accidents. Number five, people will smoke marijuana in pot stores Right next to schools, daycare centers, and churches, they will smoke weed and sell pot at state fairs. Maine's um, initiative does not allow for consumption in public places. However, any restrictions on tobacco use also apply to marijuana use, according to the text of the initiative. Number six, businesses could not fire employees for using marijuana. A section from Maine's Recreational Legalization Initiative explicitly contradicts LePage's final claim. Um, And quote, this chapter may not be construed to require an employer to permit or accommodate the use, consumption, possession, trade, display, transportation, sale, or growing of cannabis in the workplace. This chapter does not affect the ability of employers to enact uh, and enforce workplace policies restricting the use of marijuana by employees or uh, to discipline employees who are under the influence of marijuana at the workplace. So uh, that's uh, Governor Paul LePage uh, from Maine, who uh, is obviously uh, lying to everybody to try to get uh, the initiative not to pass in Maine. So that's another despicable liar. Everybody needs to check their sources. Um, uh, breaking news out of uh, New Mexico. A couple years ago, uh, one of the Santa Fe dispensaries was trying to sell out. Uh, well, I call it a sellout. Uh, they were trying to bring in a uh, uh, a company from Canada to infuse their business with um, with funds that were that were needed. Um, Peter Saint Cyr, the uh, the cannabis. A uh, reporter here in New Mexico uh, broke this news on Facebook a little while ago. This is from Peter St. Cyr's um, Facebook page. Uh, Willie Ford's management firm, uh, Reynolds Greenleaf & Associates, RGA, which manages three New Mexico cannabis groups and claims 16% uh, market share, got funding from iAnthias Capital Holdings, a Canadian firm, uh, in January of 2016 to expand its New Mexico operations. Uh, news now that the uh, foreign firm's $2.3 million uh, loan has been converted into preferred equity shares. And um, reading this from uh, Yahoo Finance um, from Toronto and New York, uh, iAnthias, the company uh, which delivers comprehensive solution to financing and managing licensing cannabis cultivators and processors and dispensaries throughout the United States, today announced the closing of its investment in Reynolds Greenleaf and Associates, uh, LLC, RGA is what they refer to themselves as, a medical cannabis management company in New Mexico. RGA has management agreements in place with three vertically integrated nonprofit medical cannabis license holders and one for-profit manufacturer licensee. The clinics managed by RGA, Reynolds Greenleaf and Associates, collectively uh, have a current 16% share of the market for medical cannabis sales in the largest in the state. So um, as I find out more about this, uh, well, here's a, here's a quote from Willie Ford um, in this article. Uh, William Ford, RGA's founder and managing director, added, quote, Partnering with iAnthias will allow us to implement our growth strategy to expand our clinical operations as well as compete, excuse me, complete development of a uh, production strategy to provide value-added cannabis-infused products 
for our license holders and others in New Mexico, end quote. Um, our GA uh, has managed agreements with R. Greenleaf Organics, MedZen, and G&G Genetics, and Elemental Kitchen and Laboratories. It currently manages a production facility, three cultivation operations, with a total of 1,350 plants, and four clinic locations in Albuquerque. The clinics managed by RGA collectively constitute the market share leader for medical cannabis sales in the state. Uh, it was a little bit too late to uh, try to get Willie Ford to uh, comment on this today, but we'll try to talk to him this week. I believe uh, Willie was against uh, Sacred Garden um, getting some infusion of cash uh, from a con- that, from Canadian company uh, Nutritional High uh, a year or two ago. So we'll have to see why this is any different. So that being said, let's move on to some... Uh, uh, other news here in New Mexico first, and then we will uh, uh, move on to other states. We'll go around the country a little bit. Um, here's a report from Arkansas, believe it or not, who are trying to legalize for uh, uh, medical use. And they came here to New Mexico, I guess it was a short trip, to talk to some of the experts. And um, it seems, uh, if you remember my uh, comments last week, my, my little rant about uh, trying to get a friend into um, uh, the medical cannabis program who's very, very ill, and uh, Andrea Sundberg didn't have time uh, to speak with me about expediting the application, but uh, she did have time to go on TV. So she's, and uh, Darren White are two of the experts that are being used uh, in this report from Arkansas, and here it is. So voters are set to head to the polls next month to decide whether medical marijuana should be legalized in the state of Arkansas. There's been a lot of debate over how legalization would impact the state. We sent our Drew Petromo to a nearby state that legalized medical marijuana because safety matters. Drew is looking into that aspect of the issue. He's joining us now live from Albuquerque with more on this. Hey, Drew. Hey, Bob and Ashley, you know, during the debate back home in Arkansas about these medical marijuana proposals, public safety has been one of the major concerns of opponents. Ten years after it passed here in New Mexico, we wanted to take a look at the impact. If you don't have a medical marijuana card, there can be a civil violation for that. Lieutenant Michelle Williams has been with the Santa Fe Police Department for 15 years. This corridor pretty pretty much for the most part in, in graveyard hours is a lot busier. Her stint spans both the time before and after medical marijuana was legalized in New Mexico. Have you seen an impact? Uh, a little bit, yeah, I would say so. For one, she says dispensaries that sell marijuana have been burglarized and robbed. They have become somewhat of an easy target just because of the, the advertisement of what clearly is in the facility. But when it comes to drug dealing and abuse, she says there's been no impact. Another area of concern calls to the Poison Center for marijuana exposures. They've increased 50% in the eight years after medical marijuana was legalized compared to the eight years before. While there have been no deaths, the largest group impacted is teens aged 13 to 19, some of whom have been hospitalized. Obviously, the use or access to the product from adolescents is a huge concern. 75% of the 31,000 people currently enrolled in the New Mexico program are diagnosed with PTSD or chronic pain. They are difficult conditions for doctors to verify, leading some to speculate people are gaming the system. The more cynical side of us probably would, but the way we look at it is these are folks that have a certified diagnosis from a licensed medical practitioner. I get it. There are people that are very scared. I was. Darren White is an Army vet who spent 30 years in law enforcement, including seven, as sheriff of Bernalillo County, which includes Albuquerque. During the push to legalize medical marijuana, he was opposed. I just wasn't convinced um, that it was at that level yet where it could be just used medicinally. These other options, these are hard candies, lollipops, right down to the, kind of the specialty bonbon. Now he's on the board of a nonprofit that grows and sells it. One over during his struggle during pain from injuries he received on the job. It's a very good alternative uh, to just a steady diet of, of painkillers. It's, I, I can't even explain how much better it is. Maze. Maze with an S though, right? Lieutenant Williams says yeah. overall legalizing medical marijuana has made the job of policing easier and more effective. 
allowing officers to focus their efforts on more serious problems. The things that really capture our attention and, and really monopolize our time are the things like heroin and meth where people are, are dying over it. Take a look at this flyer here. We've noticed these or as we've made our way around town. This is advertising for a medical cannabis expo later this month. It says right on there, get your medical cannabis card quick and easy. Doctors on site. It's stuff like this that has led some to criticize the program. Some in law enforcement that we've talked to say that it is more than just those seeking marijuana for medical use that are actually ending up with these cards. Still proponents say the vast majority of people on it are those that are benefiting from it medically. Reporting live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I'm Drew Petromo. Back to you. All right, Drew, thank you very much. And you'll see more of Drew's live reports from New Mexico all this week on KRK4 News. You can also watch them online at ArkansasMatters.com. I'll try to uh, get some clips from the other uh, stuff shot here in New Mexico. Uh, moving to the West Coast, uh, in Reno, candidates disagree on medical marijuana access for veterans. Now, how can anybody deny anything for our veterans? As it stands, veterans getting care at VA facilities are unable to discuss medical marijuana treatment with their doctors, even in states where it's legal. If interested, they must go outside the VA system. This issue was looked at by Congress this year, but ultimately nothing was passed. During a recent debate on KRNV's Nevada Newsmakers, incumbent Republican Mark Amaday said he does support medical marijuana for veterans. But the caveat is it needs to be titrated. So if there's a use for it, then fine, use it for that. But let's not be handing people dime bags and telling them to, 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 to spark up um, to smoke their medicine. What do you mean specifically by titrate? That means you turn it into a pill. Amaday's Democratic challenger Chip Evans said he supports any type of medical marijuana for veterans. There are people coming back from Afghanistan, they're, they're seeking treatment, and they're being denied marijuana. And then they go talk with their brothers at the VFW hall. Uh, the Vietnam vet says, hey, this works for a whole rash of things. So we should make it legal and, and available to our veterans in whatever form they, they choose. Amaday has served as representative for District 2 since 2011. This is the first time Evans, the former Washoe Democratic Party chair, is running for political office. Noah Glick, Reno Public Radio News. So, uh, again, there's, there's always naysayers around. They just don't get it. You know, they think that smoking cannabis, smoking anything, has got to be bad for you. But that is not true. There's been... Uh, all kinds of uh, reports and studies that say that uh, smoking cannabis, of course, you come on to the effects a lot quicker and get relief a lot quicker, but it also uh, increases lung function, lung volume, and has no uh, uh, way, uh, you know, as of, the, as of right now, it does not uh, create any kind of lung cancer. So uh, that's more bad information from people who are against it. Um, however, in... Tennessee, a uh, lawmaker uh, went to Colorado, and uh, this is what he found out doing research on uh, legalizing and what's happening in Colorado. I always thought that marijuana use was basically for potheads, but I'm beginning to believe that I think this plant is really God's hope. Is medical marijuana in Tennessee a real possibility? One East Tennessee lawmaker says yes, and he's in Colorado tonight on a fact-finding trip. Good evening and thank you for watching. In May 2015, Governor Haslam signed a bill into law that made it legal to use cannabis oil to treat certain medical problems here in Tennessee. That was a big step for medical marijuana supporters, but the push is on to move the state even further down that trail. WBIR 10 News reporter Leslie Ackerson joins us with plans in the works for one East Tennessee lawmaker. Leslie? John, before he does anything, State Representative Jeremy Faison of Cosby wants to do some research. He's learned that despite the cannabis bill change two years ago, some families have still packed up and moved to Colorado, telling him the oil does not have high enough levels of THC. So to get a better understanding of the pros and cons of medical marijuana, Faison headed out west this week on a self-funded trip. The genesis of this trip has to do with a little lady from Greene County. It's infants like Josie struggling with seizures and veterans fighting PTSD. 
realizing that the medicines that the FDA has approved, that it has given them, for many aren't working. That sent State Representative Jeremy Faison across the country to Colorado on a mission. He's met with families, talked with doctors and farmers, live blogging the entire journey on Facebook. I've got five men who have served and fought for your freedom and for my freedom. They live now in Colorado for their freedom. And I've learned so much. It has been amazing what the, the benefit that this plant has done for these families. The purpose of his travels was to find proof of the benefits of medical marijuana and examine the science behind it. Today I went to Haley's Hope. They call it a grow, where there, there's a huge place where they, they grow. Sometimes it's in-house, sometimes it's a hothouse. Faison says legalized medical marijuana would be extremely affordable for patients and an economic boost for East Tennessee farmers. Farmers will be able to benefit greatly, and when our farmers benefit, then everybody in the state benefits. When the legislature returns in January, Faison plans to share his new knowledge and try once again to bring change to Tennessee. I definitely want to push for a medical marijuana bill in Tennessee. It's been pushed for for years. It's never got off of square one. Now, Faison is not in favor of recreational use. If you remember just a few months ago, Knox County resident Steve Cooper attempted to collect 20,000 voter signatures to get questions on the November ballot regarding both medical and recreational use of marijuana. However, he did not get those required amount of signatures. John? So, uh... It's interesting, you know, you would think that Tennessee would, uh, you know, with all the farming there, would really be pushing for it. But let's hope that they can uh, uh, get medical passed at least. Uh, That's the important thing that's been helping so many people. Um, Speaking of that, here's a cancer patient battling in their state to get medical cannabis so that they don't have to move somewhere else. Uh, You know, these refugees, cannabis refugees, it's just terrible. Uh, as I've said before, medical cannabis needs to be federally legalized, which could happen, I hope, soon. Now NBC5 investigates a local woman is battling stage 4 breast cancer. Now she's also fighting the state to get medical marijuana, but why is it taking so long? Here's NBC5 investigates Phil Rogers. Illinois currently has 19 sites growing medical marijuana. That's a lot of product for just 11,000 patients. It takes away the nausea relaxes me, makes me feel better. That really works. It does, yeah. Bob Schneider has stage four breast cancer. She's on chemotherapy and says marijuana makes it possible to lead a relatively normal life. This is a night and day difference for you in being able to tolerate these drugs. Yes. Schneider tried to sign up for a medical marijuana card last May, but it wasn't easy. The state rejected my fingerprints. I went back, was fingerprinted again. They were again rejected. Examiners told her they couldn't read her prints, that effectively she didn't have fingerprints. So they took her information for a manual background check, but she never heard back. Then I started calling every day, and no one ever answered the phone. I got voicemail, left messages. No one ever called me back. Schneider freely admits she is using marijuana illegally now to alleviate her nausea. But the state has a legal program, and she wants to take part. Why does the state have this program if they make it so hard for people to get what they need? The state health department told us they are processing as many as 1,200 applications a month. But it's been five months since Bab Schneider submitted hers. I've never even had a traffic ticket. I don't understand why a background check would take so long. And if this is happening to me, it's happening to a lot of other people. Asked why this is taking so long, the state health department told us a variety of factors can slow down the process, including when a fingerprint search can't be used. Since we started making inquiries last week, however, the state told us the application had now been approved, and she received her card in the mail today. But Ms. Schneider told us tonight she still believes this should not take five months. Phil Rogers, NBC5 Investigates. Can you imagine the Illinois program or any program taking five months to get a stage four cancer patient into the program that exists. That is despicable. No matter where it happens, whether it's in Illinois or whether it's in New Mexico. We'll be right back with Josh McCurdy from Grandma's Boys Consulting to talk about harvesting, trimming, and curing your personal grow.
PTSD, MS, glaucoma, seizures. All of these diseases have seen beneficial impacts with medical marijuana. It's outrageous the federal government is saying there's no medical use. And until they move from Schedule 1, they are literally saying that. Help the average person understand the difference between a Schedule 1 drug and a Schedule 2 drug. Well, it's really simple. Schedule 1 drug has no medical use, and a Schedule 2 drug has medical uses. Marijuana does not meet the definition Dr. of Schedule Dr. 2, Dr. and you can create those products, no. and we should do that. Clearly, clearly, Schedule 2 is easier to access. It's a small difference. Well, then why are you, why are you resisting that difference then? To deny people medicine that can help them based upon some idea that this might create a problem or, or, or a slippery slope, uh, that undermines the common sense of things we already are doing. It's stuck in the 60s. People wanted to demonize this as a hippie drug that had no value and not actually study it. Have you written to the president or asked Yes, the they'll say, there's not a body of research that shows the medical effects in U.S. literature. Legalizing marijuana, whether it's medical marijuana or recreational use. Right now, that is not federal policy. Well, surprise, surprise, it's a Schedule One drug. Of course there's not a body of research because you've precluded that research from being done. It's a catch-22. The medical marijuana, the medical marijuana radio, radio show. Hey, this is Scott from Rare Dangness. You're listening to Medical Marijuana Radio. And we're back, and uh, I'm really happy to have Josh McCurdy back on. Josh is a uh, patient uh, in the New Mexico Medical Cannabis Program. He's also a uh, patient advocate and an advocate for the program, and he uh, has Grandma's Boys Consulting. Uh, tell me about Grandma's Boys Consulting, Josh. Um, it's a consulting company I put together. Uh, uh, I dealt with a lot of patients here in the South that didn't really know how to grow, and um, so I wanted to help them, and, and so I figured I'd do a consulting company to help with PPLs, and I called it after, I named it after my grandmother because she really helped me get into this industry and, and, and you know, made, made, like, let me know I was making the right decisions, you know, because getting into this industry from some of your family can be kind of difficult. <laughs> right, well, uh, a lot of people's grandmothers don't understand this stuff, but uh, it sounds like you have one that does, and, and that's fantastic. So, and there's a lot of room uh, for, for consulting, and people do need some help. So uh, I just wanted to have you on today to discuss uh, harvesting, um, uh, 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 trimming, and curing. It's, it's time right now, all the, uh, the people with PPLs that are growing outdoors, especially uh, everything is winding down. Uh, it's time, you know, if you have the right equipment to tell, it's, to, it's time to, you know, get your plants pulled. So uh, let's talk about outdoors for a second. And uh, when is the best time to pull your plants and what are you looking for and, and what kind of uh, utensils are you using to, to uh, figure things out? Um, I go back to all, I, I try to keep it all scientific. Um, I use a, a jeweler's loop. I can, you get them off of eBay. They're LED illuminated. They usually have a 30 and a 60 um, and they're like a $5 item. I, I really, really enjoyed using that. Um, I kind of look at the trichomes and, and the colors, you know, to see if the amber on my outdoor plants, I usually try to let them go even a little further to their more amber instead of just the milky. Uh, that's, why, that's why, kind of, why, is, why do you do that for outdoors as opposed to indoor? Um, they just, it, I leave them out there as long as I can, especially where I live. You know, it's been getting already in the 30s. Uh -huh. So um, I, I just try to leave them out there as long as, long as I can. And, and I like my medicine to really work. I like that the, the couch lock, the... That, that feeling of the medicine. I really like the strong, that, the strong feeling of the medicine. And, and it seems to work when it has a little more amber. Just, just, you know, just my personal preference. Right. Well, I, I think you're right about that. And, I, and um, just from my past experience, uh, if you let things go to uh, all milky with some amber or a lot of amber, you have uh, a product in the end that uh, most people find is better for sleep and for pain. Uh, but... but uh, you know, I have this thing that I talk about every year, where I sort of uh, harvest uh, in, um, in, in, in sort of I, I break it up. Okay, I take some, and I, by the way, I use a Carson uh, fifteen dollar microscope that has a light in it, and it, it's uh, you can see from sixty x and up to a hundred x, 
and um, I look at trichomes uh, as well. Um, I tend to uh, take some that when it's all milky with some a little bit um, uh, clear left in it. I might take a few branches and, and of course, mark the harvest date and so forth. Uh, that sort of gives you one type of effect, uh, maybe a little bit more up. Um, and then I tend to take some when uh, everything is milky, and then I leave a few branches to go along uh, to get that amber uh, into it. Uh, that's just sort of something that I've been doing for a long time, and I just keep them separated by the, the cut-down harvest date. Oh, that, that's a great technique, yeah, selective harvesting. I mean, it, especially a really great technique. Uh, you can get, like, you, you know, you got every profile you need in there from, from your one type of medicine. <laughs> Even right. just one strain, so. right? But but you know most uh, you know the people that I hear on other radio shows and some of the experts you know you listen to, uh, uh, I think DJ Short actually uh, uh, confirmed to me that this was a good idea to, to harvest it uh, uh, a little bit at a time. He does the same thing, and uh, and I found that interesting because I was sort of doing that on my own, and and I love DJ Short. He's responsible for the breeding of uh, the blueberry and uh, vanilla luna and uh, I think flow is his too if I'm not mistaken um, but uh, so so tell me now what is next you cut down your branches or you cut down the whole plant some people cut the whole plant and hang it upside down some uh, cut individual branches and, and then hang those give me the process of what happens after you uh, uh, cut them down um, what I usually do before I, before I even know I'm going to cut it down I'll take all the fan leaves off of it i strip that down before i even cut them down mm -hmm. um you know and and i always cut everything down at dark uh between you know indoor outdoor it doesn't matter i, I wait till it's dark and i cut them down in the dark period mm -hmm. and what do you think that does um I, i'm not real sure i i just really i i, I think it makes it the smoke just better it, you know if you're gonna if you're gonna be smoking it or vaporizing it I, I believe it has a lot more of the pure taste in there. Mm -hmm. There's not so much chemicals going on, uh, you know, all that stuff, all the all the fun stuff that goes on to the into the plant when the when the lights are on. You know, that's when all the chemical exchange and the leaves and and all that's going on. So I just kind of do it at dark. I mean, that's why I did it indoor when I started. So when I started playing with outdoor, I was like, well, I'll just do it the same way. Uh -huh. uh, I just want to go backwards a little bit and just talk about maybe the last few weeks before you cut it down. I know that. Uh, if you're using uh, you know certain kinds of uh, nutrients and so forth, you have to flush for you know ten days or two weeks beforehand. Tell me your opinion of that, and, and when's the best time to start flushing? Um, it I, I kind of it depends on the system. In my hydroponic systems, like pure water culture, I'll I'll, I'll do 14 days out. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm using a soil or soilless mix, I'll actually flush for four weeks, which sounds crazy. But um, I really pay attention to my parts per million coming out um, of, of, my, of my plants and everything. And that's how I got to that. Mm -hmm. um, real big fan of – I like real nice, you know, clean medicine. I, mm -hmm. I want to taste the turpins. I'm, I'm a big fan of the turpins. <laughs> now, now, do you think that there's some point to where the terpenes and flavonoids sort of start to dissipate if you uh, leave, leave it out too long? Um. I think a lot of the temperature has to do that. I, I know turpins are real sensitive to temperature, mm -hmm. and um, and especially like direct sunlight or UV sunlight or any kind of UV light. Um, yeah, I believe stuff degrades and and it can. I mean, I know you know even in my indoor rooms, I, I drop my temperatures down to um, sixty eight degrees. Uh huh. Yes, uh, I was listening to again. I'm going to bring up DJ Short. Um, he was talking about uh, in in the mid to low sixties. Uh, yes. In the cure, the the longer uh, it takes for it to uh, you know get crispy, and the, the better. Okay. You, you, yeah. Now we're here in uh, in New Mexico, where uh, parts of our state uh, you know are very very dry, if not most of the state. And uh, I sort of you know since I've been uh, having a, a legal PPL here for uh, since 2010, uh, I guess this is my seventh season, and I've sort of figured out my own routine due to the climate uh, where I live. Um, it seems to me where I live, uh, we have about uh, three days hanging, okay? Um, and then I, I you know, cut down the buds and, and uh, put them in a paper sack for one to two days and then into jars. Um, but tell me what you do. Uh, that's sort of what I have to do because I know the climate where I live. So uh, let's get back to you. You decide 
when to cut down your plants due to looking at the trichomes and, and what color they are. Uh, where do you go from there? Um, you know, then I, I cut them down. Uh, I usually cut the entire plant down and then I'll make uh, bud sickles out of it and I'll hang them. I won't do any trimming or anything. Uh, I don't do any wet trimming. Um, I, I like to do it dry myself. Uh, but I, I just let them hang and, and usually I, I put them in my grow room, one of my, fl- my flower room and with the, with the humidity, I have a humidifier and everything and hold it at 50% humidity and, it, and it'll take anywhere between 7 to 10 days to, to get to the point where I, I think they're good enough that almost, this, almost to where they snap. Right, yes. I, I, when I do mine, uh, I also hang like each branch. You know, you can cut the branches off and, and you hang it by the little bud that's at the top of the branch over, over a string or what, however you're doing that. Um, and uh, sometimes I'll, 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 wet, uh, uh, I'll, I'll wet trim and, uh, and sometimes I'll, I'll let it go and I'll trim it after, uh, you know, it, it, the little uh, branches snap. That usually tells you that, the, you know, the bud is in its drying stage. So um, go ahead and tell me uh, after you uh, have hung it, how long are you generally hanging, do you think? Seven, seven days, you think? Um, yes, yeah, se- se- seven days. Um, I usually hold the humidity in my room at 50% mm-hmm. so I control the environment so I can slow it down. And it depends on the plant and strain. You know, I've had some, uh, some buds where they were so large that I needed to dry them within a, a sooner, a, a, you know, sooner because I knew they would, they would try to mold and stuff on the inside. Right, so everybody loves to show off the big buds and, and uh, so forth, but uh, there is a problem with mold. So once uh, they're, they're dried, before you, you get into the cure of it, uh, I find for myself, I, I just pull the little buds apart, okay, and, and separate them uh, after, you know, the, the, the stick, you know, the stem snaps and, and when it goes into the, uh, the paper sack is what I do after I hang them. But uh, what do you do? Um, I hang them, they snap, uh, and then I then I um, I trim them, and then I'll buck the buds, which you mean I'll cut them from the main main main, main stems, right? And you know just have the buds themselves, and then uh, I'll put them in a, in a in a glass jar, and with a hydrometer, and uh, really I really shoot for that sixty two percent humidity in there. I, I learned I, from the Bavita pack. I used the Bavita pack uh, for one time, and and the way my bud felt, you know, personally, I thought it was wet, but it, it, it was, you know, that connoisseur cure, mm-hmm. which, which is, you know, most people don't really understand that. You know, the connoisseur cure is right there at 62%. And after, you know, you hold it there. And when you take that bud out, you let it breathe. And then you, you consume it mm-hmm. type of thing, you know. And, and I, was, I did it wrong for a few years. I, I let it dry and be crunchy. And then, you know, I thought that was perfect. And then when I started getting the science of it, and finding out the percentages and these nifty little hydrometers you can buy, you know, real cheap, and started using that to do the science behind it. And uh, it definitely improved my product. So once you got them into jars, what is your procedure? Obviously, you want to keep it in a cool, dark place. Uh, do you open them up and burp them for uh, some time? Uh, tell me the procedure there. Um, I, I, I used to. And since, and since I got the hydrometers and they're in every jar, I know what the humidity in the jars are. So I actually watch the numbers. Once it goes over 65%, that's when I'll burp it. Mm-hmm. And, and how, uh, how long will you go through the – when you burp it, are you, are you leaving them open for 15, 20 minutes or a half hour? Or what, what is the time limit where you open up all your jars? Um, what I do, actually, I take the entire jar. I put another jar on top of it, the wide mouth jars, mm-hmm. and I flip it over. So I put the – the buds that were on the bottom now are on the top, and I, and I let it go for about five minutes, and I put a lid on them. Mm-hmm. Okay, very cool. That's interesting. Um, uh, and then at some point in time, you know, I went to a, uh, uh, a seminar down in Albuquerque some years ago with Kyle Cushman, and nice. um, uh, he was very, very helpful. We talked about, uh, you know, what we're talking about now, about uh, burping and, and uh, jarring and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, and he said, you know, he doesn't like burp for a couple of weeks. You know, it might be two or three days or so. And then once you get to a certain point, I guess you probably have a hydrometer that'll tell you where you like it. Uh, he just mm-hmm. leaves them shut and then that's it. Yes. Until you want to use it. Now, um, I do all of that myself in the ball jars and in the cur jars. Uh, but then for long term stor- storage, if you really want to uh, just help. You know, keep the terpenes fresh and the flavonoids and so forth. I'm using these Myron Voliv jars that come from Sweden. They're dark, 
uh, purple with uh, UV protection, and uh, they're airtight. And, and I have some medicine that's uh, five and six years old that when you open up that jar uh, and take a whiff of it, it'll, it'll, it'll really be very impressive and it'll knock you out. I, I really believe those jars are the best um, for keeping your, your, your medicine in. And I have some smaller ones um, that, you know, maybe have an eighth, uh, an eighth will fit in. I have some that'll fit at a quarter and some that'll fit two ounces and one ounce and so forth. So uh, I like to leave a small jar out uh, so that I'm not constantly going into the main stash and allowing air to come in and, uh, and degrade. So uh, I'm sure that you can understand that, right? Yeah, yeah, that that you're right. No, those jars are amazing too. They really are. I mean, if nobody knows what they are, they should look them up. I mean, they they are they are amazing to, to store your medicine in. Absolutely, there, it, it, there's almost like some. I know this sounds ridiculous and it's not scientific, but there's almost some like magic to those jars. It's just when you open up one of those jars, when you've really cured your your medicine, the aroma and and you can pick a bud out of that jar. And I swear, if you gave it to somebody and said, "Here, feel this." They would think that you just harvested it within a few weeks, and, and it could be a year old. Right. The, the stuff really, there's nothing like it, and I advise everybody to, uh, to go out there and, and do that. Um, tell, me, tell me what else uh, that we, maybe we didn't touch on, Josh. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, from, from flushing the plant to uh, checking the trichomes, um, you know, taking major fan leaves off to... to to cut the plant and to hang in it to where it's dry, you know, the, 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 uh, stem snap, you know, is the old school way to do it. And I did that for years and it worked great for me. Um, yeah, I mean, and storing it, like you said, in a dark, cool place where the temperatures don't vary much. I've even, uh, even put medicine in jars in my, uh, crisper in my refrigerator mm -hmm. at the freezer, but the refrigerator and, uh, you know, it, 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 it held it amazingly. That scares me a little bit because of condensation and maybe some possibility of, of something getting moldy. I, we back in the uh, late seventies and early eighties, we used to keep you know our sealed jars and stuff in in refrigerators. But I think uh, uh, technology now has told us that maybe that's not such a great idea. But it's it's all about personal choice and what you've tried and and what works for you. I try to you know look at the experts and and see what they do and and try to learn from from them. Um, we didn't talk too much about trimming. Do you do like a, a dispensary trim for your own stuff? Are you trimming so that you know uh, what you, know, you put together to make oil with and so forth? Give me a little uh, trim info. Oh, yeah. I, I, I dry trim, and uh, I, I trim it really nice, manicure it really well. And, um, yeah, I use all the, all the sugar leaf and everything uh, for edibles. Um, you know, I, I'm a, I love edibles. They're great. And... Um, I'm I don't a, know. That's, I'm that's a big fan. I I'm a big fan myself. Um, do you test your your medicine? Do you do you uh, test some of it just for curiosity's sake, or do you just you know smoke it, use it, and you know how oh, no, good I, it is? I, I test it. I, I'm real big in the science the science part of it. That's why I got the hydrometers now. Um, you know, and they're very inexpensive. I just try to stick to the scientific numbers, and uh, that's definitely improved everything I've done. I believe um, I've grown strains side you know for a couple of years and. And known, seeing the difference in the turpins, the flavors, just by doing these little things, just scientific little things. Are, are there certain strains that you have found over the years um, uh, you like better than others and, and grow better? And maybe you've grown some strains that you don't want to grow anymore because maybe the yield is not good or they're just uh, light buds. Uh, t tell me about how you pick your strains. Um, I, I, try to, I, try, I try to do a lot of research about them, and then, and then I go from there. Um, you know, look at the lineage of them, see where they came from. Uh, one of my favorites is the lemon sour diesel. You know, uh -huh. the, I'm a big I, fan. I, I love, I love that one. Um, I like real fruity strains. Um, you know, the jelly bean. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like those super flavorful strains. I don't. I'm not a big fan of the big, you know, the old school skunks or. I I just don't like that flavor as much as I do of, of stuff that tastes like a Jolly Rancher. I guess. <laughs> I hear you. You know, I I um, you know obviously I like to grow some uh, indicas and some sativas just to have a balance, you know, something for nighttime, something for daytime. Um, I've grown uh, super lemon haze at least three harvests, you know, three, three seasons so far, and it really is one of my favorites. The, the, the aroma, the terpenes are just amazing, and it's a strong sativa. It won uh, best sativa at the Amsterdam High Times Cannabis Cup, I think, in 2009 and 10. It was two years in a row back around that, 
that yeah. time and uh uh, I, I really love that strain, the, the, uh, the Blue Dream. I know that everybody, you know, sort of laughs about that sometimes because it's it just got so big. But the Blue Dream really has some incredible flavor. Uh, it, it tests real well. It, you know, there's some good amount of THC, and it's just a very flavorful uh, uh, plant. I feel. Um, yeah, I'm growing, I'm growing the Blue Dream right now as we speak. <laughs> ah, cool. Yeah, I, mine is. Uh, uh, I'm still waiting for some some more uh, uh, milky trichomes and. Uh, uh, you know, I'm outdoors and um, under high security, of course. Uh, I advise anybody who grows outdoors uh, and indoors, for that matter, to have security cameras uh, 24-7, which are very cheap. You can get these Foscam cameras. It can record to the cloud. It can record to, uh, you know, a, a, a PC and, and just, you know, for peace of mind and to let people know that they, they don't need to be coming in your backyard. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously Indica's uh, mature a little bit earlier than uh, Sativa's. It's, my, my longest Sativa, I think, was last year, and I actually took it in on November the 10th, <laughs> uh, which was very long because we had some freezes. It's really tough to grow outdoors in, in, uh, in this state, especially the northern part of the state where, where I live. Um, but, you know, I, I use... Um, seedfinder.eu is my genetic place to look up strains and to see what uh, you know the history was you know the genetics going backwards right. and so forth um, you know they tell you that you know certain indicas for example might be a, a 50 to 55 day flower and certain sativas may be 65 to 75 days and so forth but uh, for me it's all about using the microscope or, or your loop and looking at the trichome, I, I just I don't trust that uh, you know sixty days is what the plant's going to be ready because it really has to do with you know how much sun it's getting and that trichome production. Uh, oh, yeah. I find that uh, over the last few years, Josh, here in New Mexico, um, uh, my outdoor plants and I only grow outdoors. I I just can't get a handle on indoor for myself. Um, but um, I, I'm finding that uh, every year. They're starting to flower a little bit earlier, okay? Um, obviously, again, the uh, indicas will uh, be ready for harvesting sooner because they, they have less flower time. But uh, this year, for some reason, uh, I'm finding that things are just, there. there's just still lots of clear trichome. And uh, only the last even couple of days, I'm seeing that things are starting to get milkier. And we're, you know, we're having cold nights and, and uh, leaves are turning purple. They're very pretty and everything. Um, but it's really, you know, you grow these plants, you start seeds in March, you know, you, you, you baby them, you get them outside uh, June 1st because of the, the lighting here in New Mexico. Uh, so it's really a short outdoor season. Um, and uh, towards the end, it can get uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty crazy when, when the nights start getting into the, uh, the low 30s. Is there a temperature that you feel is about the lowest you should go uh, without covering them? Um, you know, I, I've not, I've had outdoor plants up here. You know, I live in the South, but where I live is around, around 7,000 feet. And so we had, you know, we had low, lower thirties in, in the, I don't know about the third week of September. Wow. So some of our plants already started changing. Um, but I've knocked snow off plants before in the middle of November. I have um, too. I have some pictures. I'll have to post some on Facebook, uh, at some point. Yeah. I've had some so, snow in, uh, uh, I guess the earliest snow was October 8th, a few years ago. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it gets hairy. And what, what I do in that case is I, I buy some, uh, hefty bags, some really heavy, maybe they're six or eight mils thick and mm -hmm. I double them up and, and you have to get all those branches into the hefty bag and it'll take off, uh, you know, a couple degrees. So if it's going to be, you know, 30 degrees, 32 freezing, you know, if you put the bags over top of it, uh, it can, it can save you a couple degrees. Um, I think it could. I was told once uh, that the plants can take like 28 degrees, and then after that, you, you know, you're you, you're pretty much in trouble if it's going to keep getting to that uh, on a constant basis. I was watching a, I was watching a, uh, it was a video, lo you know, blog, and they were, uh, they'd put their plants out way early, uh, and this was up in, um, I want to say Colorado, but they would give them warm water, 70 to 73 degree uh, water during the early parts of spring, even when it was cold up there to, to put them yeah. out uh, in like January. See, I think the problem is, um, is the light to dark, uh, dark. uh, you know, 
if you put them out. I used to try to get mine out as early as possible. I think I put them out May 15th uh, one year, and you know we still get some freezing uh, in May. Um, yeah. And But I found that um, they didn't do that much better, and then maybe they even flowered earlier when you put them out too soon. It seems that here in New Mexico, at least up where I am in Santa Fe, uh, is that June 1st seems to be where the, the light and dark ratio uh, is good. So Yeah, uh, and, I, and the way they were dodging that, they were having a LED spotlight. Uh, it was 15 watts per plant that would keep them just happy as could be in the veg in the veg state during that early that early winter i mean that early spring winter so, uh, just to uh, to finish up i th- you know i think we did a great job on uh, when to pull them and harvesting and and uh, uh curing and manicuring and so forth um let's just get back to um uh, grandma's boys real quick uh how can people get in touch with you if they need help and uh and how do you charge uh, for that um i i i'm uh, you, you get a hold of me. You can get on the Facebook. I have a Facebook at Grandma's Boys Consulting. Um, my cell phone number is 575-808-3257. Um, how, and, about, uh, how about your YouTube channel? Because I've watched your videos. I think they're very helpful. I think people should go and check them out. Um, yes, I have a, a YouTube page, Southwest Scrogger, um, also on YouTube, uh, that, that I do You know, video grows and everything on to help everybody out. So... Um, yeah, they can they can check it out there too, and and always go to the web page and everything. And and I charge I just charge like thirty bucks an hour. Some you know it just it really depends. I mean what I'm doing. Um, you know I, I'll make designs for pretty for pretty cheap. You know you give me the size of the rooms. I can re, I can source different um, any of the equipment you ever need, mm-hmm. and I usually can get it at a lot cheaper price than most people find it. Um, and that's just because I'm I'm working on opening my hydroponics store. So, or my indoor growing store also. So I've been really involved uh, talking to companies and stuff. Uh, I just yesterday I got off the phone with uh, the uh, the president of Blue Planet Nutrients, Robert. So I'm looking into bringing them in and trying that out, the Blue Planet Nutrient line. Yeah, you like to experiment a lot, which I think is really great. So Josh McCurdy, thank you very much for uh, uh, telling our audience here at Medical Marijuana Radio your expertise. If they have any questions, check out uh, Josh McCurdy on Facebook, his grandma's boys consulting on Facebook, his uh, YouTube uh, channel. Southwest Scrogger. Southwest Scrogger, and you'll see these tremendous buds that this young man is able to uh, to put out for himself and and I thank you for sharing your knowledge today Josh. Hey well well thank you for having me and thank you for all your advocacy you do for the program and and keeping everybody honest. I appreciate how you how you you, you put them in this light and give them the hard questions and we get to see how they really are. <laughs> yeah, I call myself a bullshit uh, detector so that that's that's one of my jobs. So Josh, thanks a lot and uh we'll have you back again I'm sure uh next year. And uh, whenever you need to promote something, we'll be right back after this. Thanks, Josh.
Well, uh, thank you, Neil, for the Harvest Moon. Take a look in the sky tonight, people. And uh, thank you, Josh McCurdy, for uh, telling us about uh, your methods in uh, harvesting and uh, uh, curing and so forth. Uh, check out Josh's stuff. Also, I want to thank my two radio mentors, both with the initials HS. Thank you for your inspiration. If you have a uh, product, a service, uh, you're a patient, you want to tell your story, uh, write us at info at mmjradio.com. Again, info at mmjradio.com. If you've missed any of the old shows, you can check us out at uh, my website, which is medicalmarijuanaradio.com or mmjradio.com. Also, uh, my YouTube channels, LS Love 88 On SoundCloud, SoundCloud and Spreaker, it's MMJ Radio. On CannabisTube.net, I hear they're back up and running. Uh, we're also on Spreaker and iHeartRadio with the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. On Now TV, channel 937 and 420 radio.org. Shalom.